I'm here today to talk about uh, open versus endovascular therapy for aortoiliac occlusive disease, choosing the right approach for the right patient. I have no disclosures. Uh, I do have one disclaimer, although I am a surgeon, these are two of my favorite cases, so I'm basically comparing an endo-ABF to an open ABF, um, so I'm duly biased. But uh, I think when you're looking at comparing two therapies, it's important to define the players you have, and you're really looking at uh, the outcome profile versus the risks the risk profile for each uh, individual patient. And so when you look at the historical gold standard, uh, aortic bifemoral bypass has really stood the test of time and has great five-year patency rates and even great patency rates out to uh, 10 years. Um, but this comes at the, at the risk of a substantial risk profile. And when you look at the complications associated with it, they are not insignificant. Um, the biggest ones being groin complications and sexual dysfunction as well as a significant risk of uh, myocardial infarction and even death, up to 4% in some series. Uh, there's also late complications. I think many of us have dealt with uh, limb thrombosis uh, not infrequently. And so with this risk profile, uh, there are a certain amount of patients that just can't withstand this therapy. And so uh, the alternative in the past has been an extra anatomic bypass. And when you look at the outcomes for them, even in the best of hands, it's pretty dismal, 51% five-year patency for an ax unifem and a fem-fem bypass at 75%. And so with this, there's really been that unmet need for another therapy, and endovascular therapy has kind of rapidly evolved uh, with respect to uh, treatment of this. Um, looking back in 1964, Dodder and Judkins did the first uh, balloon angioplasty for stenosis, and from there, uh, really, the treatment of the iliacs progressed with an 85 first defining the kissing technique for balloons. If you look, the technical success rates have been good for this, um, but the five-year patency wasn't very good. Uh, they then moved to using balloon expandable stents, and that improved patency, uh, but not uh, to the point where it could really compete uh, with open therapy yet. And then we started uh, exploring other kinds of stents, so self-expanding, especially for the external iliacs. And then in 1998, the Dutch iliac stent trial really solidified iliac stenting as a uh, valid therapy uh, with good clinical success rates at both two and five years. And so now when we look at our options for treating the patient who comes to us with aortoiliac occlusive disease, we have multiple therapies. And so the question really has become, how do you choose what's best for which patient? And out of this was born the, uh, the task classification. And by the time task one came out in 2000, it was already essentially obsolete. So they started preparing a new one. And in 2007, task two came out. Um, and this is the, the writing. I do better with pictures. And so this is the uh, picture profile of kind of the different classification scheme, obviously going from more simple lesions in A to uh, very complex ones in D. And when you look at the recommendations, they recommend an endovascular approach for uh, A's and then open for D's with uh, B and C kind of in the middle looking at different patient factors. Uh, World War II General MacArthur said rules mostly made to be broken and are too often for the lazy to hide behind. And I think he would be really proud of, uh, of interventional and uh, vascular surgery in this respect because these are essentially the second test two was published. All of these papers have started coming out and they really haven't stopped. And these are all looking at treating really up to uh, test C and D lesions with very good results. So why have we been able to get these good results with endovascular therapy looking at the outcomes in the past? We've really progressed in our treatment of uh, first balloon angioplasty and then the consideration of stents and who should get a stent whereas who should get a balloon. As well as looking at stent types, I referred earlier to balloon versus self-expanding in different locations and defining where they're best used. And then also looking at covered versus bare metal. The graph to the right is a comparison study looking at a stent graph versus just a basic stent for the uh, iliacs. And you can see improved patency rates there. And then also looking at more physiologic reconstruction of the bifurcation. So this is three-year uh, outcome data for the CEREB technique, which is more of a physiologic uh, reconstruction of the bifurcation. And then also looking at treating your outflow disease. And so if there's a component of common femoral disease, including that in your reconstruction improves your patency rates and outcomes. And so when you look at what factors help us to decide, I think there's a couple good papers that I pulled. This one's out of New England, looking at the durability of multi-segment occlusive disease. Because I think for a straightforward task A, task B, even task C lesions, 
we know that endo probably uh, is the first approach. But looking at multi-segment disease where you're treating multiple factors, what are your components that should point you one direction or the other? And in this study, they found that the external iliac artery lesion really contributed to decreased outcomes, even when it was treated, obviously, because if there's a lesion there, you're going to treat it. But patency rates, both primary and primary assisted, were significantly less when the external was involved. The other factors they found was a requirement for thrombolysis, which is likely just a surrogate for a long segment occlusion because of the thrombus in between the two caps of the lesions. Uh, interestingly, they had a couple uh, weird findings. Uh, male sex was higher risk, which is different than previously published studies. But when they looked at the males, uh, there was a heavy component of external disease in, in this population for their study. And so they thought it was from that. Also, the absence of cardiac disease, uh, which you would think the reverse was true. But what they found was uh, medical management was much better in those with known cardiac disease. They were on statins. They were on aspirins. Uh, whereas the just vascular component probably wasn't treated as well. And then looking at a study of uh, 5,300 patients, meta-analysis, all the way from 1989 to 2010, uh, they found kind of what we have over time open. Uh, the patients were slightly higher risk with poorer pre-op runoff scores. Uh, they had longer length of stay and more complications, uh, including mortality at 30 days. But along with this, uh, you got the benefit of uh, globally increased rates of primary patency. And so at one, three, and five years, for both primary and secondary, we're better for open therapy. And so take home message is really, it's difficult to define absolute criteria for this. Nobody fits in a box very well. I think you need to consider each patient individually. But there are some factors to consider. When you look at a patient in the clinic, patient-specific cardiopulmonary status, that may take open therapy off the table. And so you're going to be deciding then between extra anatomic versus endovascular. And frankly, I would go to endovascular almost every time uh, over doing an extra anatomic bypass. That's kind of my absolute last resort. Um, age, if you have a real young patient, uh, we know the need for reinterventions is higher with endo. And so it may be better to do open on the front end. Uh, however, the caveat is that focal disease, endovascular is still first line consideration. Uh, so that one common iliac lesion, uh, I think most of us would still just go for a stent. Uh, gender, most studies demonstrate decrease in women, but as we saw the other study, uh, perhaps uh, it's less gender-based and more distribution of disease. And then looking at disease-specific factors, so severity, occlusions versus stenoses, long segment versus focal, uh, things that make endovascular approach a little bit more difficult. And then really considering involvement, if you have total occlusion of the entire external iliac artery on both sides, I think uh, your, your task is going to be a little bit more difficult endovascular and your patency may be less. And then looking at runoff disease uh, and then uh, the severity of their presenting symptoms. Thank you.